So our next speaker needs no introduction. Uh, Larry Goldstein is uh, the director of the stem cell program at UC San Diego, um, has his hands on a variety of different projects. Um, but I think today he'll tell us about uh, his work on iPS cells and, and looking at neurodegenerative Thank diseases. You. Thank you. Great. So uh, when Adam asked me to speak about aging, I realized that the only thing at the time I thought I knew about aging was my own personal experience, <laughs> which has been anything but fun, I suppose. That's probably what most of us do. Maybe we get a little smarter or wiser, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but then I realized that actually we do work on Alzheimer's disease in the lab, and of course Alzheimer's disease, like most diseases, your risk goes up dramatically with age. Uh, and so that sort of gave me a forum for thinking about how to tackle uh, this morning's talk. But then at the end, I'll turn the tables on you and tell you how the pathways in Alzheimer's disease have actually recently been discovered by uh, a group in Iceland to be right at the core of cognitive decline during aging, which is very surprising. So the, the core problem, ultimately, in Alzheimer's disease is that not only is it very common, but in some ways we think we know what the basic pathological features are. Uh, you probably know that the amyloid plaques, which Anne and others have mentioned, are thought by many to be the triggers in a biochemical pathway, sometimes called the amyloid cascade hypothesis, that leads to neurofibrillary tangles, synaptic loss, and ultimately neuronal death, which is the core problem in Alzheimer's disease. And this gets worse and worse with aging. Uh, and in fact, the, the numbers are terrifying. 10% uh, of people over the age of 65 have this disorder uh, in the United States, 50% of people over the age of 85, and by extrapolation, probably something like 1 or 2% of people my age uh, have this disorder <laughs> or have committed themselves to this disorder. And uh, you can imagine my uh, love of that statistic. Um, and of course, the other problem is we have no drugs that change the course of the disease. The public health problem is uh, enormous. Uh, the cost of the United States uh, is 200 billion a year and climbing, uh, and uh, we really need to do better. I hope that Anne's work will make progress. I hope that our work will make progress. We need a lot of shots on goal. But of course, as a disease whose prevalence increases with aging, you have to ask, well, how can we dissect how this works? We know that proteolytic processing of this molecule is in some ways at the core of the disease, this amyloid precursor protein, fragments of which lead to the amyloid plaques and perhaps the tangles. Now, often what's done to solve a complicated problem like cancer, heart disease, aging, what have you, is to find rare mutations in the human population that have high penetrance. That is, everybody who has that genetic change or mutation absolutely gets the disease. And of course, in aging, one such mutation is progeria, which Juan Carlos Belmonte here has worked on. You've heard about mutations that change telomere function. But the fact is, those mutations tell us a little bit about the pathways that lead to Alzheimer's disease or aging or what have you. And in fact, mutations in the amyloid precursor protein gene will cause Alzheimer's disease in people. But the large fraction of disease, aging, Alzheimer's, is not caused by simple single gene mutations. It's caused in some way by each of our individual genetic variation interacting with the environment in some way. And of course, in Alzheimer's disease, we know that the so-called heritability the genetic contribution to risk of disease is 60 to 80 percent. So there's an enormous impact of each of our individual variation on aging, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, what have you. And the question then is, how the heck do you analyze that? And that's a hard problem. And if you do population studies in humans, you need to analyze hundreds or thousands of people to make any progress. And even then, what you get are clues, and it's hard to do, as you know, experiments on people. If I wanted to you know, test my most recent idea on Roger, you know, I'm going to bring him over to the lab and dose him up and take samples of his brain and all the rest. I'm not going to get away with that. And so how can you solve it? So we started recently uh, what I call the Craig Venter Project. 
uh, which is in some ways designed to try to understand how individual genetic variation might contribute to drug response or susceptibility to disease or what have you. And the reason for doing this, of course, is not a publicity stunt. It's because Craig's genome is fully sequenced and we know all of his genetic risk factors that have been discovered thus far in population studies. So the basic idea then was to biopsy Craig. Uh, so my student, Mason Israel, arranged for Craig to give a piece of skin. So he has skin in the game, as we say. Uh, fibroblasts were cultured from those biopsies and then using standard retroviral techniques, we made induced pluripotent stem cells and of course that allows us then to make neurons, for example, or astrocytes or other brain cells that carry Craig's unique genetic variation, his DNA. So we have Craig's brain cells in a dish. He comes over and visits them periodically. They're very aggressive. They, they're megalomaniacs. <laughs> uh, they take over everything in the culture. <laughs> but they have these really interesting risk factors that you can study biochemically. Now, the traditional view of this problem, if you talk to people at coffee breaks or whatever at meetings, is, is in a sense shown here. And that is typical genetic studies in human populations, so-called GWAS studies, usually reveal that variants at individual genes have rather modest contributions to risk, 20 to 30 percent changes in risk. And of course, you have to analyze hundreds or thousands of people in these genetic studies, as I just mentioned, to detect those tiny changes. Now, the assumption that's often made is that if the mean risk is some value, and let's say it's some low value here, that in fact, the distribution will be narrow, meaning the assumption is, well, if I have 1,000 people, I have an average low risk, each person individually will have an average low risk. And that's not necessarily true, and it has an important implication. It may, in fact, be that if you have a mean risk that's, say, some value low, you could have a very broad distribution in the population of risk so that some people have very substantial risk values from that individual variant, and some have very low values. And in the lab, what that translates to is an assumption or an idea that if risk is low, individual phenotypes of cells that carry the genomes of people will be very low and narrowly distributed. That is, you would have no hope of discovering any biochemical change in neurons that carry individuals' genomes from this room that would be meaningful or detectable. Whereas if the situation is really like this, it could be that individual variants, if you capture them and study them in IPS lines and the neurons, would give you measurable phenotypes in some cases and not others. That is, a notion that there's a very broad range of phenotype, and if you had some good way of detecting it, you could learn something. And so Jessica Young in my lab tackled this problem using Craig's genome as the starting point. Because it's known that Alzheimer's disease has 30, 50, or more different genes where common variants can affect risk in this sort of low effect size way. And Craig in particular, it turns out, is homozygous for the risk variants at a gene called SORLA. That's a very interesting gene, as you'll see. When I say common risk variants, what I mean in this case is that Craig is homozygous for this risk variant, as are a third of the people in this room. So a third of you are homozygous for this risk variant. I don't know who but I'll find you eventually. <laughs> and what that means is, if there's a phenotype conferred that you can detect, it has meaning for rather large numbers of people. Now, the SORLA gene itself is interesting because it's what we call an endocytic trafficking factor. And to keep this accessible to those of you who are not experts on trafficking pathways in neurons, the basic idea based on studies in animals and in cell culture, is that this protein plays a role in determining whether the amyloid precursor protein is processed in a way that we think is toxic, or whether it's processed that is turned over in a way 
that is rather more benign. Okay? And so the notion is less of this protein gives you more bad processing, more of this protein is protected in some way based on how it shepherds the amyloid precursor protein through its biochemical processing pathways. And the prevailing hypothesis based on work in animals has been that the common risk factor in the human population might act by diminishing in individuals the overall levels of SORLA expression. And so this is what Jessica set out to test using IPS technology. And we take advantage of our ability to prepare purified neurons by fax sorting based on methods we developed collaboratively with Becton Dickinson, Christian Carson in particular, with Shauna Yuan in my lab, developed these methods. And so we can make now pure neurons from people that we've generated IPS lines from. And in this case, we've sampled, as you'll see, about a little more than a dozen different genomes of people who are homozygous for risk variants or heterozygous or who are homozygous for what we call the protective variant in the population. And so when Jessica looked at the overall level of SORLA expression as a function of the genotype, either protective homozygotes, heterozygotes, or risk homozygotes, it's very clear the prevailing hypothesis does not adequately predict the behavior we see in the human population. Perhaps not surprising, the animal work doesn't have the kinds of variants we see in humans. And so in fibroblasts, in neuronal stem cells made from reprogrammed stem cell lines, IPS lines, or in purified neurons, the basal level of expression of SORL1 is independent of the actual genotype at this locus. So the, the simple model is not correct. But Jessica, being a creative and smart postdoc, figured something out that was important. And that is that it's the ability of the SORL1 gene to be induced by neurotrophins, in, in this case a particular neurotrophin BDNF, which plays a very active role in sustaining the differentiation and viability of neurons in the adult brain. The observation is that if you're homozygous for protective alleles or heterozygous, exposing those purified neurons with those genotypes at the SORL1 locus gives very detectable and substantial induction of the level of expression of this gene. Whereas if you're a risk homozygote, you have whatever your level of expression is, but you don't get a boost by exposure to BDNF. That's interesting for a whole bunch of reasons that you'll see momentarily. And uh, the stats on this are, are very good. P is much less than 0.01 using Fisher's exact tests and assuming it's a binary phenotype for those of you who keep score here. Now, why might that matter? So it turns out that, as I mentioned, SORL1 will determine, in some way, the level of this supposed neurotoxic fragment of the amyloid precursor protein by controlling whether APP goes into a benign alternative processing pathway or into a pathway that is thought to lead, ultimately, to the development of Alzheimer's disease via the amount of A-beta produced. And so, if you do the simple experiment, then, of taking these same purified neurons with different genotypes at the SORL1 locus, what you find is that BDNF not only boosts SORL1 expression, but it drops the amounts of the so-called A-beta fragment, which is thought to be toxic as a result of these pathways, whereas the risk homozygotes don't experience any drop in, in A-beta Production. There's really no protection from BDNF. And using uh, shRNA experiments, Jessica was able to show, let me just check the time here because we should be finishing up. She was able to show that that drop in A-beta is really dependent on SOR1 expression. And so what this tells us is a couple of things that are important. So in contrast to what was predicted based on the animal work, it's not the overall level of SORL1 that's determined by the genotype of these risk variants. It's the ability to respond to standard inductive signals in the brain. And you can get reduced bad processing. So that's really interesting. 
And so the third of you who have risk homozygotes may not experience this benefit. Now, the magnitude of the change is interesting. It's about a 20 to 30 percent change, and that's on the order of what you might expect for sort of mild, moderate effect sizes. And you could say, well, that's meaningless. You know, we love to measure things that have 10 or 100 fold differences in our experiments. But in fact, in humans, if you have a 50 percent change in APP amount as a result of hereditary duplications of the gene, so a 50 percent increase, that's enough to give you Alzheimer's disease in your 50s. So these 20 to 30 percent changes are actually very meaningful for thinking about risk caused by these variants. And they are detectable, we think, using this technology. And so the other risk loci, we think, may be amenable to this sort of analysis. And of course, the other thing this tells us is that if you're doing clinical trials that act via the BDNF pathway, you may want to stratify your trials based on the genotype at this locus. Now, what does this have to do with aging? So what I've just told you is this locus has some impact on the development of Alzheimer's disease via its effects on the processing of the amyloid precursor protein, APP gene. So there was a very recent experiment last year from DECODE in Iceland, which reported that there are rare mutations in the Icelandic population that protect against the development of Alzheimer's disease. And those mutations are in the APP gene, and they reduce the proteolytic processing of APP, analogous to what we see with SORL1 induction. And what's remarkable is that it's not just that they protect against Alzheimer's disease. They also protect against the normal cognitive decline that's seen as a function of aging, telling you that not only are variants that affect APP processing important for thinking about Alzheimer's disease, they're actually important for thinking about the normal cognitive decline that many of us are experiencing as a result of aging. And therefore, that this IPS technology and the sort of rigorous focused analysis of how these Alzheimer's variants affect APP processing may also tell us a lot about how to impact the normal aging that's independent of the development of neurodegenerative disease. So I think that's it. Yeah, let me stop there. Okay, so I'll stop there and we can turn it over to Adam and the panel. Thank you.